from maintaining a, a strong trading relationship to defeating terrorism to cooperating on a number of threats around the world, including North Korea, which was just mentioned. The United States and Canada really have a very close shared mission and shared objective in addressing all of these. Our countries enjoy the most extensive economic relationship you'll find anywhere in the world, and there are a number of opportunities to grow that relationship, important opportunities, and build on the strengths of both countries in the years ahead. U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson in Ottawa on Tuesday. No question that there are big differences in U.S.-Canadian foreign policy, more obvious maybe now than ever after Trump put his America First mandate uh, announced earlier this week. But what is the state of the Canada-U.S. relationship in spite of all those differences? Andrew, Chantal, and Althea Raj are joining me here in Toronto to talk about all of that. Do you want to start? What is the state of the relationship? Yeah, I mean, well, because, because there are so many differences. I mean, you only have to look at the, the move on Jerusalem to think about, uh, you know, foreign <coughs> policy difference where the difference couldn't be more glaring here. The Four Trump White House and the Justin Trudeau government were never going to be simpatico. <laughs> um, they feared that Trump was going to win, but they were in disbelief that he actually won on Election Day. I think that the Liberals have done as best as they possibly could. Mm. You know, they've really used tools that we wouldn't have thought about, like leveraging Ivanka's relationship with her father uh, to help uh, further move Canadian yeah. foreign policy goals. They have been rather smart strategically. We've talked about this, about building bridges with governors and with local members of Congress and basically fanning across the United States to help sell the image mm. of of Canada and make the case for NAFTA. They probably need to do more work with Democrats because Democrats are not necessarily going to be... Uh, pro-NAFTA, um, and they may have underestimated uh, that uh, angle. But, I, I mean, what more to say about this topic? I'm not sure. Yeah. They're, they're starting to see differences towards the latter half of the year. Mr. Yes. Trudeau has come out and said things that are critical about the U.S. on North Korea, for example, and their policy. But aside from, like, tiny little changes, I'm not sure that we've really seen a progression. There's been the, they've had the two tracks. One was the sort of what I might call Trump whispering, you know, trying to cozy up to him in various ways. I, I must say that female entrepreneur initiative mm. was a little hard to take because it was basically whitewashing Trump's mm. rather problematic issues with women. But, but that side... Pink, pinkwashing, I think we pink call it. Pinkwashing, <laughs> maybe that's what I'm for. Uh, but he would... So that, I think, has been perhaps less successful than this broader effort to fan out and yep. to develop power sources and, and alliances outside of Washington, outside of Trump's circle. The thing I would also say, though, is Trump is a much diminished figure himself now. He's at 33% yes. in yes. approval rates. He's in a lot of trouble with the Mueller investigation, et cetera. So it may be that the, that the smarter thing to do was to have that broader approach and to develop those alternate power centers. Well, but I wonder if that, those, those facts, make it easier for Justin Trudeau's government to sometimes oppose him more vocally or be more critical publicly. Yes. Well, you asked about the state of the relationship, yeah. and I'd say better than expected by most this time last year which yep, is a plus, uh, and don't read anything into it uh, re relative to the future, because that is what we have learned. Canada is not big on the Trump radar, and when it is, it's usually a, a something to beat up on to try to divert attention, yep, and, 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 yeah. and that hasn't changed. And although I agree that Trump is, uh, is diminished and he's got problems of his own, that also makes him more dangerous for Canada mm -hmm. in the sense that he needs easy wins. Oh. Yeah. And he has, in his rhetoric, continued to portray Canada falsely, uh, has a, a big trade problem, and mm -hmm. I'm going to deliver you yes. jobs, yeah. etc. Always accompanied by, but that Justin Trudeau is a good fellow. Yes, yes. my best friend. <laughs> so, so <laughs> but, the personal relationship doesn't seem to have bought us a lot. No, you know? no, but, not yet. But Trump is also a gift to Justin Trudeau. To this yes. day, he remains a, a point of comparison to voters who always say, let's relativize the problems here. We're happy enough totally. that we have Trudeau and yeah. not this. Less, less but he's too, also yeah. a, a gift to Andrew Scheer, because now Scheer can point to, for example, the tax package and say, see, this is something that will embolden his agenda. Maybe there will be policy where he has something to propose. And it's also a way for Andrew Scheer to point to Justin Trudeau's failures and saying, you didn't get this done. I mean, that's certainly, you know, the government, given credit, when Trump was elected, was very seized of the importance of this. Everything had changed. Just to pick up on Althea's point, that tax package changes a lot of things yeah. for Canada, and yes. we are going to have to respond to it. And I have not seen a signal from the government yet that no. they get that. Yeah. And guess who's going to have to be the lead person on the tax change thing? No, not the revenue minister. 
<laughs> Del Morno. Or the Prime Minister, if they <laughs> figure it, yeah, Del Morno can't yes, handle it. But people do not see Justin Trudeau as, uh, as Paul Martin. Yes. If Paul Martin yeah. was, as Prime Minister, going to have to do that, it would have worked. Okay. But this is a different proposition, and he is not... It's, I don't want to say he's not credible, but he doesn't come across as a trust me on this financial he's, stuff he's thing. damaged critically. Mm. Okay, uh, I'm going to change topics to some other news that probably didn't get a lot of play this week, and that is that Tom Mulcair is resigning from politics, although not soon, uh, in the spring, but he has confirmed that that's what's going to happen. Uh, it's been quite the journey for him taking over from Jack Layton, uh, you know, a very powerful, uh, impressive voice in the opposition inside the House of Commons, helping the NDP build in Quebec, and then it all sort of just fell apart. Mm. So what does he what does he leave behind? Uh, I mean, I realize he's already been replaced and the party's trying to rebuild, but, you know, if we're, if we're thinking back in history books about Tom Mulcair's time as leader of the NDP, what are, what are we writing in those books? Well, he's a tragic figure in some ways. He, he inherited the great breakthrough that they'd made in Quebec. He would claim credit for having been yes, a would. big yeah. part of it, um, <laughs> perhaps rashly. Uh, but I think he did well to hold on to a fair chunk of that. Uh, but given, measured it against the expectations uh, where people thought the NDP really had a shot at power. And one of the things it has to be said is, as, as poorly run as the NDP campaign was, part of it also was they had this problem called Tom Mulcair. He's an immensely accomplished, immensely impressive person, but he does not wear well with people. He is not warm. He is not good at the art of being politic, of putting your foot right. And he, more often than not, will put his foot wrong. And they knew that, and they had made these dreadful efforts to get him to smile more, remember? Yes, yes. And, it, and a lot of, I think, the problems of the NDP campaign stem from how do we... It's weird, make though, because wasn't fortunate. that the same sort of criticism around Stephen Harper? Of course that we it had was. to make him warm, and somehow people overcame that when it came yeah. to Stephen Harper. Yes, and but he didn't have to run uh, against Justin Trudeau, yeah. and when he did, he lost. Right. Uh, and um, right. Tom Mulcair was unlucky uh, that the uh, Justin yeah. Trudeau came up. It may have been the only liberal leader that he could not upset uh, with competence. I still think that when people look back, on the short period, four years, when the NDP was official opposition, no one is going to say in the future, if the NDP has problems, and it will, that it's because it was incompetent in official opposition. It didn't show itself ready for prime time. Right. And they didn't lose to incompetence. No. They lost because people went for something else. I think if you look back at the NDP experience in power or in, in roles of responsibility elsewhere, I, no, Bob Ray hates me for saying this. Uh, <laughs> what he left behind was not a legacy that made the NDP more electable. I think Tom Mulcair did not make the NDP unelectable. The lot of what happened to the NDP is circumstantial, or they did it to themselves. I agree with everything they just said. I think the moment the Keynes will remember when they think of Tom Mulcair is him being basically chief prosecutor in the House mm -hmm. of Commons, going after Stephen Harper over the whole Mike Duffy affair yeah. and Nigel Wright. But... Mr. Mulcair did not make himself a lot of friends on Parliament Hill. He is not a very lovely person to people who are not in his immediate circle. And I think there will be a lot of questions about why he is staying in the House of Commons until June. He barely speaks in the House of Commons. I think he's spoken twice. I haven't seen him He doesn't up there. come to I mean, votes that yeah. often. Yeah. Uh, you know, on the Senate side, if you miss attendance 21 days in a row, your pay starts getting docked. Those records are not public on the House of Commons, but I would encourage Mr. Mulcair to show up more often. Otherwise, people will start asking him why he is actually not in the chamber and not getting his pay docked. Why is he waiting for so long when he will engineer a by-election that will mean that that MP is only there for six months until we have another election? Oh, I think it's a Christmas gift to Jack Singh. <laughs> uh, really the, 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 yeah. the, the, the new Democrats are looking at the by-election in Outremont, and as iconic as the victory was when Thomas Mulcair won it, the, the loss, loss of it, yeah. if it happens, is going to be devastating by pushing off to June. With a bit of luck, it might get lost a bit in the traffic of the Quebec election that is taking place next fall. Where there's we, time, there's hope. Can we also say that it's really odd that the NDP has not done a big tribute to Thomas Mulcair as NDP leader? I understand that they basically beheaded him politically, yes. uh, you know, giving him 48% support. Maybe he didn't want them to do it. But it's one. very interesting that there was no, like, thank you to Thomas Mulcair before a new the leader PQ was The PQ never did that for Lucien Bouchard either, and he didn't want to show up for it. No, maybe. So this is the tribute, then. This is the tribute for Tom Mulcair that he Tommy, so much wanted. <laughs> All right, thanks, everybody. Thank Appreciate you. it.